but it's a pleasure to have Daniel Boutros telling us today about the primitive equations of ocean and the dynamics. Please, Daniel. Thank you very much for the introduction. And let me first thank David and the organizers for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, I will speak about recent results or and some not so recent results on uh, the mathematical analysis of the primitive equations of oceanic dynamics, which is this large-scale ocean model. I realize that this, uh, let's say, the subject of my talk might be a bit outside the scope of this program, so I will try to give a bit of more of a survey rather than going straight into the details. Um, but the second part will be new results, which is joint work with Simon Markfelder and Elise Tilly. So I have tried to make it non-technical, but if it's too technical, please just interrupt me and ask me to make it less technical. So um, I will first start by reminding you what is known on the analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations. John has already done this several weeks ago, but I will remind you and then I will introduce the primitive equations and survey, let's say, what is known from the rigorous analysis of these, these equations and to contrast the discrepancy, let's say, compared to what is known for this system compared to Navier-Stokes. So, and then in the second half of the talk, I will speak about uh, the Onzaga conjecture and what it means to turbulence theory and our results on the analog of this conjecture for the implicit primitive system. <coughs> And then in the second, so the, the second set of results relates to the global existence of weak solutions for the implicit primitive equations and this second part of the conjecture, but I will clarify all of that. So I have tried to introduce, use a minimum amount of function spaces, but I have some minimum that I cannot do without. So I would just remind you that the LP norms are, are defined this way. So I take a function, an integral function, I take the p of power and I take the pth root, which is the LP norm. The L infinity norm is the essential supremum, so the supremum almost everywhere in the domain. Um, I will use the Sobolev spaces, which are, if you are in HN, it means the function lies in L2 and all its derivatives lie in L2, up to nth order. And I will use the Hölder norms, or the Hölder spaces, um, which means that the increments scale like x minus y to the alpha. So that will be it. Daniel, can you speak up a bit? Yes, I will try. Okay. Okay. So, um, I don't need to remind you that these are the Navier-Stokes equations. So, I have a velocity field U, a pressure, advection, viscosity, uh, and a divergence free condition, which is which uh, encodes the conservation of mass. And I will mainly speak about two kinds of solution for, for PDE. So, the strong solution, meaning that a PDE is satisfied almost everywhere in space and time point-wise in space and time. So in the case of Navier-Stokes, it means that you are L infinity in time, H1 in space, L2 in time, H2 in space. One can show that the strong solution is in fact smooth away from the initial time. And then the second kind of solution I will speak about is a weak solution. So you are, in that case, you are in L infinity in time, L2 in space, which means the kinetic energy is bounded for almost all times and you have finite energy dissipation rate. And it satisfies, such a solution does not satisfy the equation necessarily point-wise, but it satisfies it uh, in the sense of distribution, so in integral form, and which is how the equation is originally derived, because you look at balances for the momentum and the mass in integral form. So um, this must hold then for all of small functions phi and psi for you to be a weak solution. In the case of 2D Navier-Stokes, it is known that there's global well positiveness so there's global existence and uniqueness of weak solutions and also for strong solutions, as was proven by Legay and Ladezhenskaya. In 3D, the picture is somewhat different in the sense that, um, so Legay proved you have global existence of weak solutions, so with the regularity that, I've, that I said before, but you have, you have an energy inequality, and it is unclear whether this is in fact an equality so for almost every time for all times t, you have this inequality. Legay also shows you have short-term existence of smooth solutions for smooth initial data, but it is unclear whether these smooth solutions stay smooth or they have, there is a finite time singularity. And then over the years, there have been many works, and this is by no means a comprehensive sum summary, but some of the results pertain to regularity criteria, so as was shown by Polise and Skiaza, Sriyeg and Spirak, where if you have a weak solution with control over these norms, the polycyan uh, norms. In fact, that solution is smooth. 
You can also show for, for weak solutions that the singular set, if it exists, is bounded in, in, in measure. So Caffarelli, Cohen, and Nirenberg showed that the house of dimension, the one house of dwarf dimension is zero of the set, so it cannot be more than a line. And you can also show relatively recently, this was shown by Buckmast and Vico, that if you do away with this regularity here, you have, you have non-uniqueness of very weak solutions for the navier stokes equation. But what is still open, as I said, is you have uh, the, the, the uniqueness of the globally existing beret hop solutions and, the, and whether the, the, the locally existing strong solutions form a singularity in finite time, this is open. And um, I, of course, this is not the only problem. There are other problems like the inviscid limit with boundaries, the connection of the, the Legay Hope solutions to turbulence and so on. But I will, what I will speak about in this talk is mainly related to the mathematical features, let's say, well pause and existence of solutions and so on. So you may ask me, how is 2D different from 3D? One way to look at it is in terms of the vorticity, which is the curl of the, the the velocity field. So in 2D, the vorticity is of course a scalar and it satisfies this nice advection diffusion equation. So you can, this is enough to obtain control over critical norms, let's say. So, but in 3D, the vorticity becomes a vector and you have this extra term, the vortex stretching term, which in principle can lead to amplification of the vorticity and this is hard to control from the analytical point of view. So, this is one way to look at the difference from the analytical point of view, but also you can say it is known that Navier-Stokes has this scaling symmetry that if U is a solution, then if you rescale it this way, it is still a solution up to some rescaling of the domain, of course. Um, these energies, so these quantities in 2D, they are invariant under such a scaling, but in, in 3D, they uh, in 3D, they are subcritical, meaning it is insufficient to control the small scale behavior. So, I mean, of course, there are more ways you can look at this problem, but this is one way, two ways to look at the difference between 2D and 3D. So, this is what is known for Napier Stokes and very broad strokes. So, let me now turn to the primitive equations, which I will consider them in this form. So, now I'm still in 3D. U has two components, um, but it is still 3D, it is the horizontal velocity. The vertical velocity is, is given purely by the incompressibility relation. It is no longer dynamical. It is just, it just it is fixed by the mass conservation. So you can erase W, of course, and insert here this integral of the horizontal divergence. Um, we still have viscosity and we have the hydrostatic balance. Um, I have ignored the coupling to temperature and salinity here, but often, from the mathematical point of view, they can be included without that much problems, so let's say. But um, I, will, I want to stress at the outset that here, in fact, in the advection, you have an extra derivative compared to Navier-Stokes. So if the viscosity would not be there, it, this is hard to control. So if you want to control the nth order derivative, you in fact already need control of the n plus one of order of the derivative. So this is the system. So how do you derive this system? What you do is you take, you take Navier-Stokes with this particular scaling of the vertical viscosity, which is essential because if you, you can justify that from dimensional, on dimensional grounds, but if you take a different scaling, you converge to a different system. So you have to have this scaling of the vertical viscosity. You take Navier-Stokes in this fin, fin domain, and um, one wants to rescale it in a way that the domain becomes just periodic, a fixed periodic torus in, free, in, in all three directions. So one, one performs this rescaling and then one obtains these scaled Navier-Stokes equations on the three-dimensional torus. And you can see now that if I send epsilon to zero formally, the mo vertical momentum part is going to go to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and we are left with the hydrostatic balance. And I, sh I should say already that in many cases this can be justified rigorously. This, but this is now, at this moment, this is formal this is a formal calculation. So as I said, so this is this approximation, of course, uh, this works with, if you look at the ocean on, or the atmosphere on large scales, when the vertical scale is much smaller than the horizontal scale. Um, so this is why Richardson introduced this model originally in the 1920s for numerical weather prediction, even before the advent of computing, as I understand it. 
the first people to study this model from the mathematical point of view were Leon Staman and Bang, where they showed the global existence of Legay Hopf type weak solutions, so weak solutions obeying the energy inequality. Um, Ian Gonzalez, Masmudi, Rodriguez, Berlido proved that you have a local and time smooth solution, which in some sense is a bit more, it's a bit more difficult because you have this extra derivative here from, from that point of view. Um, then, who, Tamam and Zian proved that if you have a fin domain, so it's a, let's say it's a doubly fin domain, if the primitive equations are posed in the fin domain, you can show the global opposedness depending on the data, which is a bit like the result by Rogel and Sell from the, the 90s, where it's the same for 3D Navier Stokes. If you are in a fin domain, you have global opposedness. Um, then it was shown that you have, in fact, in 2D, you have uniqueness of weak solutions, and you also have global opposedness. So the, 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 the strong solution stays smooth in the 2D case. So up to this point, this, these results are in the same vein as Navier Stokes. So there's you have in 2D you have you are well posed, and in 3D you have these global weak solutions and local strong solutions. But in fact, it was shown a few years later that for this system, which excuse me, Dan, before you go on with that, I I ought to stress to the audience that Richardson introduced this idea precisely because the W by dt really is small by several yes. orders of magnitude in data except where you've got large convection storms. So that work, works nicely as, lo as long as you don't have these massive storms. It's a very good approximation. Yeah, and as far as I understand, it still derives the, the, many of the, the numerical codes for better prediction for the ocean. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one often thinks on large scale things of Coriolis forces which isn't in your equation, is, there, is, is that irrelevant or? So you, you can treat the Coriolis force, but in, in fact, the Coriolis force makes it better often. Uh -huh. so, so let me just say, so for, in the viscous case, you are well posed without the, the, the rotation, but then you, you can treat it with. But in fact, I will say later that in the inviscid case, you have blow up of the solution, but the rotation prolongs the lifespan of the solution, so it makes it better. But it, I, I will not discuss it at length now. But um, yes, yeah, so this is where I was. So you can show, in fact, um, that the system, so you suppose you have H1 initial data, so you are in the, the data as L2, and its gradient is also L2. You have a unique global strong solution in L infinity H1, L2, H2. The solution becomes smooth away from the initial data, and you, it, de it depends continuously on the, on the initial data. Um, so I will say a bit more how you, how, what the structure of this, I, this proof is in a moment, but this was first with done with Neumann boundary conditions, and then it was shown also with Dirichlet boundary conditions. This H1 requirement can be weakened, as was done by Hiro Kashibadaya. This result is with a, a linear equation of state. So here you couple with the temperature and you have an advection diffusion equation for the temperature, but it was shown by uh, Peter Korn that you, you can also work with a nonlinear equation of state, and I think he used the one that is used in practical computations, which is this polynomial type equation of state. Um, and let me now also say that even though we have this result now, up to this point, the legay hopf weak solutions that we have from Leon, Staman, and Wang, it is still unclear whether they are unique or not. So due to this result, we know that any weak solution becomes smooth away from the initial time, but it is open whether there could be non-uniqueness at the initial time. So there are lots of results for particular cases of the initial data, it being L infinity, L infinity the Z drift it being L2, and so on. But in general, this problem is still open. So what is the difference now for this system compared to Napier Stokes? And the answer lies in the decomposition of the system into the biotropic and the bioclinic modes. So you can take the average of the, the, the vertical average of the, of the horizontal velocity and the fluctuation, the biotropic and the bioclinic modes, and you obtain this coupled system. And yeah. Yeah. Not only do you not, don't have F in your model, but you don't have stratification. There's no density variation in the vertical. But you're talking about variclinicity now. So can you help so, understand what's going on? So, okay, so I'm, I'm not discussing the, you can, you can include temperature here. 
or you can you can work with with equations of states, but I'm just I've ignored it for the purposes of this talk. So equation of state, but you, you don't have a density equation. So you, you know. The rho is, is you have some relation between the salinity and the temperature and, and the density. Right. It, it, yeah, but you can forget about salinity and temperature. Just work with density, but you don't have a density equation and you don't have gravitational. Yeah, we are incompressible. Yeah. You need density variation to get varicosity, but you don't have a density variation anywhere in this model. But I mean, the density variation is different by the temperature, correct? Okay, sure. If you want. You want the, to ori the original t TT paper does have he's just doing a strict elevation. Yes, exactly. There's a, it, I so can, so, so, so I, now you're the, about the, the main theorem actually has the temperature variation. There's a temperature here, so this, this equals the temperature, and then I have an equation, an evolution equation for the temperature. Okay, so I understand that you would strip it down, and I was going to accept that, but now you're talking about vericlinicity, and I don't know how you can separate out veritrop and vericlinic if you don't have density, or if you, if you can strip that away. I mean, you can. So, so is it somewhere it's buried in there, I guess, but I just can't see it. It is buried in there, but I, I have. I mean, okay, there's a particular order in which you have to do these things to make it work. So you have to start with the temperature and then come back to okay, the I'll work with it. Yeah. All right, so, but, but you are right, of course. There has to be, there has to be some. But I mean, it's. How do I say this? Also, the inviscid system without temperature is sort of already difficult enough as it is to treat somehow. Like it's it's very irregular, and it does not seem any kind of vari density variation in general helps, with some exceptions here and there. At least from the mathematical point of view. Anyway, but um, so I mean, this is I, I define these modes this way. Um, uh, one, the biotropic part, so this equation, it's, it is now 2D in nature, so it possesses the 2D scaling, so one can perform estimates which are similar to 2D Navier-Stokes, so you can control the H1 more. Now for this part, you have the, the bar clinic, uh, in the bar clinic part, you don't have a pressure anymore because the pressure does not depend on Z, so you, this has properties similar to the Burgess equation. One can perform estimates on the L6 norm, if I'm not mistaken, and then you, com you combine them, and then you, you obtain regularity that way. So that is, that is the very general picture, let's say. So, but you are really capitalizing on the fact that the pressure does not depend on, on Z. And um, if there's temperature, you have to do a bit more. Of course, there are more estimates needed, but uh, the, 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 it works the same way. So in fact, it was found later that you can do you can do without you don't need the full viscosity. You can do you can ignore the vertical viscosity and just if you have horizontal viscosity and then either vertical or uh, sorry vertical or horizontal diffusion, you can have global opposance as was proven in several papers. Um, in the case of you have local opposance in in um, if you only have vertical viscosity without horizontal viscosity but Results that are known for the Pronto equation, which has a similar structure, suggests that there is blow up if there's no horizontal viscosity, but this is open. This derivation that I showed you before, where you take the aspect ratio to zero, in fact, can be justified rigorously. So you take, you can show that if you take, consider the difference between the global Lay Hope solution of Navier Stokes, which is guaranteed to exist, any of them, even if they are non unique, and the global strong solution of the primitive equation, you can prove explicit estimates on uh, the difference between them, with explicit rates in terms of the, co of the aspect ratio. So you need some well-preparedness assumptions on the initial data, and then you have, this, you have this rate if the initial data is H1. If you have H2, you can, can get the convergence in higher order norms and so on. So you can, this can be propagated, let's say. So, um, so I stress there's nothing speculative about this theorem that the layer hope solutions are guaranteed to exist and the global strong solution also, so you are comparing two objects which are known to, to exist. 
So, as I said, this provides explicit convergence um, and it proves the validity of the hydrostatic approximation. Um, the weak convergence was already justified in an earlier paper by Azad and Brian, and you can, it has been improved since that you can do this in sharper spaces, let's say. And if you want to work, there was also this work where you, if you have a different scaling of the, of the vertical viscosity, so recall that I If you have different scalings here, the limit system is different, but you can show that you converge to the, the primitive equations with horizontal viscosity. So this is what I wanted to say on the viscous system. On the, in the inviscid system, the loss of derivative is really a structural problem, let's say that. In the vertical attraction term, you have already have a derivative there, so when you look, try to estimate the nth order, you need control of the n plus one. So it was shown by Renardi first at the linear level and then Hanquan at the end at the nonlinear level that in fact you are ill-posed in all sorts of spaces. So compare this to Euler now, where, you, where it is known by since the work of uh, Gatto and Evan and Marsden, where you have local well posedness in H5 half plus. Um, so what these results mean is that for sublef initial data, there's no, there can be no continuous dependence on the initial data. They work by linearizing around the shear flow, and then they construct these growing modes, which proves the ill-posedness. And from what I understand, this is somewhat similar to the, to the kelvin helmholtz instability, but when you also have these growing modes. Um, you can restore the local well poisons at the inviscid level by, you have to assume this local Riley type condition, which gives you a local strong solution at the sublet level. Or you have to work with the real, in the real analytic setting where you have no, there's, you don't see the number of derivatives in some sense. You, because you, you, are, you have an infinite number of derivatives available, so you can work with the local strong solution. Um, on your, on your previous page, um, well, on those two pages, ju just to, to, to understand. So, do we, uh, what, what does that mean exactly? That in 2D, uh, an instability similar to Kelvin Helmholtz will render your real time solutions always monstrous. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I mean, you. It's sort of. Okay, so in this case, all you know is that you cannot have uh, continuous dependence on the data. So it has not been shown that, you, that there are no solutions, as you have for, let's say, Euler in some cases, where you know that the moment you are away from the initial time, you leave the space. So as I understand, this, is not, this has not been done, but this is likely to happen, let's say. If you, because you, you say those results are based on linearization around the shear flow. So whenever you have a shear flow, which happens quite often, uh, it's a, like the shear flow has to satisfy some properties that I'm glossing off. Like it's not. Okay, so those properties are not known to be satisfied every time. There are examples where the shear flow satisfies the properties. Okay. properties. And they need to be pretty pathological. Hard to say. Well, I mean, he's, I think the question he's trying to ask is there are perfectly physical shear flows and that shear flow instability phenomena are very common. So why, what is this actually saying or meaning? There are several ways to look at it. It's you. It restricts from the mathematical point of view what you can do. It's sort of okay. For Euler, this this instability is there, but you have to you have to start from very irregular very irregular settings. So this in some in some sense it says that an instability of this form is much more can start from much worse initial conditions, let's say, than compared to the implicit primitive. I mean, it, is there does this lead to some statement about the the existence of a of a well-behaved, saturated, or end state of the instability in the wall. That's sort of how a physicist would, would look at things. But we cannot talk about an end state because we don't, there's not a, a known solution to exist. So how can you talk okay. about the next? You, can, you couldn't bound the... No, no. because it, it is growing 
without bounds, so you have no, there's no control. No. That's uh, right. And this is in 2D. This is in, these are in 2D, yes. So in some sense, the 2D system is very, is, there's only Barrow Clinic, there's only Barrow Clinic mode somehow, and it is very, very bound somehow. But yes, this is in 2D. I don't think anybody has really written it down in 3D, but of course, it is there. Um, oh yes, one thing I should say that in both these cases, for short time one can justify the small aspect ratio limit. So as long as these solutions exist, one can can justify the small aspect ratio limit until the instability prevents. Then the statement becomes meaningless because then subsequently it was shown that you have uh, there are initial data for which the smooth solution which is known to exist, for example, in an analytic setting, it blows up in finite time. Um, so one, can, one, can, one way to show it is to, to one takes solutions with a particular symmetry, u being odd in x and uh, w being even in x. The symmetry is preserved by the equation, and then you can restrict to the line x equals 0, which gives you an equation of this type. And so notice that this is now a fully one-dimensional equation where this, the flow is restricted to the line. And this, Roughly speaking, this, this equation has properties similar to the semi-linear heat equation, and you can you can show you can show blow up this way. Um, and this is an example, as I said, where the role of rotation prolongs the lifespan. So they should, Ibrahim Lin and Titi showed that if you have rotation, then for this example, the, the lifespan becomes longer as the rotation becomes large, and it becomes infinite the moment you send the Coriolis perm. All right, so this concludes the, what I wanted to say in terms of known results of the survey, if you want, is that in the viscous case, the primitive equations are well posed, even if the viscosity is only horizontal and the regularity comes in some sense from the pressure being two-dimensional. Um, in fact, from these analyses, one can show that if the pressure, if one derivative of the pressure in one direction in Navier-Stokes satisfies is in some space, you still have global regularity. So this can be translated. But of course, for Navier Stokes, one does not have this kind of control that DZP is in a particular space. Um, as I said, in the implicit case, you have ill positives in all sublab spaces. There is finite time blow up, even for analytic data. And this comes from this loss of derivative that I've been talking about. So the broad conclusion is that the viscous equation has better properties at least as, as compared to what is currently known for Navier-Stokes, really Navier-Stokes. And the implicit primitive equations are worse than the 3D Euler equations for now. So, so before I go to the, my, my own results, are there any questions, further questions? If not, so, so the, okay. The, the, the two problems I want to consider are the following. I've been stressing that the implicit equation is irregular, so is there still some way to construct global solutions? Yeah. So in, in, your, in, your previous, in your two co conclusions, do, do you understand um, the other physical explanation or you know, why and which operator? You know, the, the, in the implicit, it seems to be worse. In the viscous, it seems to be better. The, Naively, one could expect that you know, they would be both worse or both better. Yes. Why, why is that? And if you, do you understand the, that you know, losing, losing one derivative is worse than for yes, the it's, it's better for the viscous? In, I mean, in the viscous case, it's not expected, but let's say because one, the domain becomes thin. It's sort of, one cannot have too many oscillations somehow. This, this prevents, let's say, from the Navier-Stokes point of view, this prevents, let's say, too much irregularity. So maybe from the viscous, it is expected, but the inviscid, okay. So I think, yeah, maybe I can say it this way. So in, both are due to the pressure in some sense, that in 2D, the pressure has a very simple form, let's say, and it's, it, it makes it 
easier to construct blob compared to oil. Let's say the pressure is, is more difficult in oil compared to here. In the viscous case, one can take advantage of the, the sim relatively more simple nature of the pressure to use to do, do the global of Poisson's, to prove the global of Poisson's. Because for 3D Navier Stokes, it's an obstruction, let's say, that prevents you from doing a maximum principle. So, so you're saying it's not known that it is better, it's just that mathematically you will be able to go further. Okay, all right. So if you, that is what you, okay. So for, for, for 3D Navier Stokes, this is not known, but in this case it is known because uh, Euler is locally well posed and so we have spaces which we do not have, we, do, we know not to be the case in, in inefficient primitive equations because of what I said before. Here, we don't know. We don't know. Um, so as I said, so this is what I wanted to say. So I, I is there still a way to, to construct global solutions for the system and also in some sense, this is a very vague description, I understand, but in some sense, one wants to, the question is, can, there has been a lot of work on the study of turbulence using the Burgess equation, can one sort of use the primitive equations or the hydrostatic oil equations as another toy model if one, if you want, this is, if you want, this is, so, and in particular, what I want, what I will discuss relates to the dissipation anomaly, so, um, in Navier-Stokes, in turbulence, it is anomalous dissipation is quite a characteristic feature of turbulent flows. And um, so if you measure the dissipation rate in a turbulent flow for unit volume and you let the viscosity decrease to the right, you will see that um, it, it attains a constant value rather than uh, uh, go to zero as you would naively expect. And this is also confirmed by direct numerical simulations, as I show here. Um, the question is, okay, so suppose I have a sequence of Navier-Stokes solutions exhibiting this kind of behavior. Can you hope to describe the limiting behavior with Euler? So assume for a moment that these, these solutions converge to Euler, which is an assumption. Does, do the fundamental models tell, tell us anything about this, about this phenomenon? And so one uh, conclusion one can draw from this statement is that the limiting object, if it is a solution of Euler, it must dissipate the kinetic energy. It just follows from the energy inequality. No question. Okay. Um, but you can, an elementary computation tells you that if, that this is actually conservation law for Euler, just take the drop product of U and integrate by parts and it gives you the, it gives you the conservation law. So there's, the limiting behavior suggests that the kinetic energy must be dissipated, but the conservation law states that the energy is conserved for at least C1 solutions, but what about weak solutions? So Onzager in the late 1940s was the first to really formalize this, and he conjectured the following. Suppose I am given a weak solution of Euler, and it lies in this Hölder space, with exponent higher than one-third, then the solution must conserve energy and hence, anomalous dissipation cannot occur. Um, below that threshold, there exist solutions that dissipate energy, not necessarily all solutions. There are solutions still in this space which conserve energy. So what he does, what Onzaga does in some sense is he connects this uh, anomalous dissipation to a precise, or when it could occur, to a precise regularity threshold, if you want. So, um, several uh, consequences of the statement of the conjecture is that you cannot, a turbulent flow, if you have a sequence of turbulent flows dec decreasing in viscosity, they cannot maintain high regularity uniformly in viscosity Reynolds number. One can have, it provides, as I said, quantitative regularity criteria for the absence of anomalous dissipation. But it's sort of, you can see it as conditions that must fail if one wants to have turbulence somehow. That, that is, that is one way to look at it. And if weak solutions of the Euler equations arise in this turbulent zero viscosity limit, which is an assumption, their special Hölder exponent must be less than one third. They must be dissipative. And it means also that if this, um, if you, this limiting behavior is described by a solution of Euler, it must be a weak solution rather than a strong solution. That is. 
So the conjecture has now been proven in full for the Euler setting. So after Onzaga, it was sort of brought back to the attention of the community by Eink, and then Constantin and Titi proved this first half that I said that if you are in C1 first plus, you conserve energy. And there was a different proof by Duchamp and Robert, and then Jeskin of Constantin, Friedlander, and Schwitkoy identified the optimal space for conservation, but it's still the optimal space. Um, to attack this second half, so the construction of dissipative solutions of Euler, the Lattice and Cyclidi brought this technique called convex integration to fluid, to, in, to fluid mechanics. So I don't, I cannot really explain. I don't have the time to explain this technique in detail, but it's sort of it's an iterative procedure. So one takes an approximate solution and one keeps adding perturbations to, to cancel the, the error frequency. So it's a frequency shell by frequency shell, or wave number by wave number. Instead of what, for example, Legay does, where he takes the estimates and then he uses a compactness type of argument to, to conclude. So this is more, let's say, uh, this is more explicit in some way, this approach. So then, in a sequence of works by Buckmaster, Delelis, Eisted, Sikhlidi, and Tricol, they, they sort of imp kept improving the regularity of the constructed dissipative solutions until the, the threshold of one third was reached in 2018. So this is up to one third. The endpoint one third is still open at this point. I mean, this technique was also used for different kinds of problems. So, as I said, by Buckmaster and Tricol to prove the non uniqueness of very weak solutions for Navier Stokes. Um, to prove non-uniqueness for the transport equation, and also to uh, show the sharpness of one of the polysarian criteria, and recently to construct solutions of Euler obeying the local energy inequality. So now the problem I would like to consider. Yes. Just, just another question. Do you understand why the one third is about? Why yes. Third, yeah. Sorry, why what? One third. What, what does it mean? Well, in Omsalga's paper, it's this sort of this rough thing. You know, basically what you're doing, you take Euler, you hit it with U and integrate over the volume. And then you're, normally you would integrate away the U dot grad U term. But to do that, you've got to do integration by parts. And if the solution is so rough, you can't actually do the integration by parts. Um, and that's why, why the, you've got these an, an, this anomalous dissipation. And he had this rough argument that said you've got, you've got three U's and one grad. Mm -hmm. So you distribute the grad amongst the three U's, and there's your one, thir one third of a gradient on each U. And that's the sort of rough scaling argument as to why one third is the, is the critical value. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah, just, this is what I was about to say, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, just... So let me add, if you could tolerate one more annoying question. Uh, I mean, it's often said uh, and that intermittency in 3D turbulence is absent, or at least much less of a striking phenomena than mm. 3D. Can this be viewed as the as the mathematical underpinnings thereof? Yes. That's what I so you said yes, John? I, I am not yes. sure, he actually. He says he's not sure. People say this, this could be possibly at the origin of basically deep, deep intimacy. The, the problem is that, I, that this statement, it works also for 2D Euler. Excuse me? This, this statement, this conjecture, it is also true for 2D Euler. Yeah, no, this is also consistent with Kolmogorov's theory, so not intense, yeah. right? One third is what gives. Yeah. Right, but but I mean, yeah. well, but as as a manifestation of the difference between two D and three D, I don't believe it to be the case. Actually, this part was only proven, I think, maybe half a year ago for two D, because in two D somehow, I said it was an iterative procedure to construct these solutions, and one uses these pipe flows to sort of build the solution. But in, in 2D, there's less room to space them, let's say, without, uh, without creating overlapping, uh, overlapping between the pipe flows and to control, let's say, the construction and really converge to a solution. So this is, it took longer to do 2D instead of, instead of 3D. But
All right, so um, the, how much time do I have, actually? 15 minutes. Okay. So um, now I think I go back to the implicit primitive equations, and that's sort of the, the mathematical question is, okay, I have, and, um, still I have a conserved quantity, but it's now the horizontal kinetic energy. What does this statement look like for this system now? So let's say, okay, just as a mathematical question, when does, when can you rule out anomalous dissipation for this system? And the problem you immediately run up against is that Onzaga speaks of a weak solution, and for Euler this is clear, you are in L infinity L2, and it is enough to make sense of the nonlinearity, but here we are still in the energy space, L infinity L2, but now W is a derivative of U, so we are in W lies a priori in a negative subleft space, so how do you make sense of the vertical part of the advection? So how do I interpret this term? So one has to fix a regularity on the vertical velocity, and what is then canonically done is to say that it is square integrable, but because of the incompressibility relation, this suggests that the, the horizontal divergence is square integrable, and there's no, let's say, reason this is preserved by the dynamics of the equation. And as I've said, there's blow up, and it seems that, let's say, full order derivatives are going to blow up. So this is a strong requirement for a weak solution. So what we do instead is we say, okay, let W be a functional, so it lies in a negative subleft space. U lies in a positive subleft space, and then using these techniques from harmonic analysis, one can make sense of the product. So one still has a well-defined weak solution. And you may ask me, okay, what have we gained? Now at least the horizontal divergence lies in a negative space, so at the end point, U lies in H1 half, W lies in H minus 1 half, and the horizontal divergence lies in H minus 1 half. All the implicit regularity requirements have been removed. So it gives you several kinds of weak solutions for the system because now you can either take W to be an integrable, as I've said, you can take W to be a functional in all of the variables, or one takes the intermediate solution where W isn't functional only in the horizontal variables because the loss of derivative is only in the horizontal variable. So now you can you understand why this there is more than one Onzaga conjecture for this system as there is one for each weak solution, let's say. So if you ask me what is the analog of the one third, then I ask what weak solution are you talking about? So the result that we have is that, um, so one first has to fix a, a weak solution, so one has to fix the, the space that the W lies in, and then there's a corresponding exponent for that. So if one assumes that the vertical velocity is in C one third plus in the Hilbert space, then one is back to the Euler setting. So one third is the threshold for everything, but now suppose you don't want any regularity assumptions on, w, on the vertical velocity to begin with, then two-thirds is the threshold. And then you can interpolate between them. So there's a scale of exponents between one-third and two-thirds, depending on this s that is, that is there. And you may say, okay, if you, fix, if you fix a regularity on the vertical velocity, you are fixing one on u by the incompressibility, but this is a non-local relation, so it is not easy to decode this into straightforward assumption. On on the horizontal velocity. So there's now this family of conjectures rather than a single one. You can work anisotropically. You can have, let's say, regularity alpha in the z direction, beta in the horizontal directions. And then one has, under these assumptions on the exponents, one also has conservation. So you have a, vert a threshold in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. The, threshold, the vertical exponent can be made one third at the expense of a higher exponent in the horizontal direction. So, okay, I, I don't want to keep going. There are many, I have made the point, there are many conjectures rather than a single one. So, um, then the natural thing is, can we say something about the second part, so the construction of non-energy conserving solutions? Um, I just want to, I don't want to explain this technique really, but I just want to say why it is useful, let's say, because for some of you, you might know, not, not be that familiar with this, but for Euler, it is difficult to construct a weak solution by any classical method. So one only has weak compactness in L2, which means that you have convergence in the sense of integral, but not, one does not have convergence of the norms. So it means that by any kind of a priori estimate, one cannot conclude 
that one has a globally existing weak solution of OLA. So, um, as I've said, so weak convergence does not imply pointwise convergence or convergence of norms. I take this example that this keeps oscillating pointwise, but it converges to zeros and goes to infinity. So the control of the kinetic energy is not enough to pass to the limits of the approximate solutions in the nonlinearity, um, which is why Legay constructed weak solutions for Navier-Stokes in 1934, but it was open whether Euler has weak solutions until 2012. Um, and as I said, so the, this method it provides a way to construct weak solutions more explicitly, let's say, by adding perturbations. Let's say frequency shell by frequency shell. So we adapt this method to the implicit primitive system. And as, as I said, we also rely on the decomposition of the system in this way. So compared to Euler, we in Euler you have to you add one perturbation at a time, but we have to work separately for the biotropic and the biochronic mode. So we have separate perturbations to treat them, uh, treat, treat the different errors. Um, and we need these new weak solution that I've dis been discussing, that you need, it is essential for us that the vertical velocity is only a function, let's say, otherwise the whole construction would break down. Um, in terms of construction of weak solutions for the inviscid primitive system, there's only one work prior to us by Kierderoli and Michalek. Um, the system day three is free the Euler with the pressure not depending on Z, which also solves the inviscid primitive system, but it's not, it does not see the loss of derivative the anisotropy and the non-locality. So the point of this work is really to study these effects in terms of it. So the result that we have is that, suppose I am given two uh, local and time smooth solutions, any of them, then I can find a weak solution below in them. So that it, it agrees with the first solution in the initial time interval and the second one in the later time interval with these regularities. So there are some constraints on exponents. This is from the need to control the bioclinic bioclinic part. This is from the need to control the biotropic vertical part. And this is needed to control the time derivatives. The, 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 the thing to take away from these regularities is that u is square integrable. u has positive sublet regularity and w has negative sublet regularity. And the product is only a functional in the construction. There's nothing more. So there's no reason to suspect it of anything more. So what does this result show? It shows global existence of weak solutions. So these are the, at this point, these are the only global solutions for the implicit primitive system. It is the first example of non-energy conserving solutions for the system and of these partly functional solutions. Um, of course, one can say, yes, these solutions are pathological because they are pathological, because one can have increasing energy instead of decreasing energy. But I have stressed that for this kind of equation, at this point, this is the only method available to construct weak solutions or global solutions in any, for any generic, for any kind of generic set of initial data. Um, we have the same result for the viscous equation. So, but then one has to assume some additional constraints to control the uh, dissipation. And then one obtains the same result. That you, have, you can glue two local and time smooth solutions together with a weak solution with the same regularities, but then with this additional regularity, which keeps the dissipation under control. And um, so, yes, as I said, so this is, um, this construction provides a way to construct global solutions or system with a loss of derivative. Um, up to this point, we don't have something sharp, unlike Euler, unfortunately, but hopefully soon. So we don't have, uh, we cannot show the sharpness of one of the, ruling out criteria, let's say, for non-dissipation, but I said soon. This construction also works for the 2D pronto equations, um, which has the same kind of structure in terms of this loss of derivative. And unfortunately for now, all these results are with periodic boundaries. So um, one would like to treat the primitive equations in the channel with no normal flow boundary conditions on top and bottom, or stress-free or Dirichlet in the viscous case. But this is for now, we cannot treat this for now, but hopefully soon. So uh, let me conclude. Um, I sort of surveyed first the, 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 the existing results for the primitive equations, where in the viscous case, you are globally well-posed. In the inviscid case, you are very irregular. Um, 
Then I, show, I discuss the Onzaga conjecture, and it's analog which forces us, let's say, to introduce this new kind of weak solution to deal with the anisotropic structure of the system. Um, and due to this anisotropic structure, one has a family of, of Onzaga conjectures or ruling out criteria for anomalous dissipation instead of a single one. Then to start addressing the second part of the conjecture, so the construction of dissipative solutions, we developed a convex integration scheme which gave us global existence of weak solutions for the implicit system, the only global solutions for now. And we really relied on, let's say, the structure of the primitive equations using the barotropic and the barotropic norms. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, sir. So this is just a struggle to understand this. I mean, would, is it fair to say from a kind of cynical perspective that what's going on here is that you, but with the decomposition into barotropic and baroclinic modes, you use Onsager, maybe appropriately generalized, but the similarity to 2D to save the day on the bar barotropic mode and use the relation to burgers to save the day on the baroclinic mode. No, actually. No? no. Okay. <laughs> All right. I thought that's what you said on one of your slides. No, so, okay. So, for the global or poisonous results, the, the, it saves the day, absolutely. But, but I mean, the, for my own results, no. It's, it's, it sort of it works the other way. So, the, one can have a conjecture without this decomposition. That's not a problem. So, for, to prove, okay, let me say it this way. So, uh, to prove the statement, we don't use the decomposition. It's not, uh -huh. not at all. To, for a construction like this, yes, because somehow one wants to utilize the pressure, right. and then one has to decompose. And, uh, right. but, uh, so it, it would, maybe the modified cynicism would be you, uh, you, to, to calculate something you have to go down the road we suggested, it sounds like. Mm. Maybe, but I, I, I can imagine you can have constructions without using decomposition. It's not, it's not a strict necessity, let's say, but it's sort of, it is, a, it is of course, it's always better to use the structure of an equation than do without, I would argue. Well, that seems to help, right? Yes. So it's Mikado densities and Mikado flow. So, but it has temporal and spatial intermittency. Can you describe uh, in terms of uh, some graphics or some intuition? You, you have used tubes. It's tubes. It's tubes. It's tubes. Yeah, it's tubes. <laughs> Not sheets, but. Are they, are they in some sense stationary solutions? They are, they are stationary solutions, but um, it's like the, the, the ones that Modena Ciclihidi use for the transport. Right. But then made, you, you have to use this temporal oscillation function. Yes. I have another question. So you mentioned se several boundaries of the exponents in the Onsager conjecture of your equation. Yes. Does those uh, boundaries of the exponent have something to do with uh, blow up. You mentioned some blow up solutions in the recent case. No, I don't think so. Oh, I see. I mean, of course, it would be nice to show that all of these. Okay. So, what you are asking me, if I understood you correctly, is that whether you can show that any of these norms blow up. That is, this is open. But because there's a problem, one of the problems from the blow up result. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I just naively thought the critical exponent has something to do with the blow up solution. And it's not. It, no, no, it does not. No, no, but what I want to say is that you, the problem was also that you are working on the line. You, I mean, okay, if you have the dissipation, if, 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 Okay, if you have in the limit, if, if there's dissipation of energy, of course you have to blow up, otherwise it doesn't work. But 
But here the problem is you are working on the line and say you have blow up in, L in W1 infinity, by trace theorems you are losing again half an order of, uh, if you want to go to a sublevel, so it's, it, you're working on the L2 scale. So this is, maybe it can be done, but I, I, don't, I don't know for now. So some of what you were doing looked like, you know, what you do in shallow water systems, right, in the thin layer and things. So of course then you've got a height equation. Yep. So if you wanted to answer these equations for shallow water, do you just, do you have to start from scratch or does it give you, do you have a hunch how the shallow water system now behaves? But the construction of solutions, no, I don't have a hunch now. But I, what you can, no, I, mean, I can mean the, for the, the conservation type statements, one just does the, the scaling arguments. But the, yeah, but in terms of regularity and finite time behavior, all of these things, I wouldn't, I don't know. There, there is some literature, but I don't, I don't remember it now, but there is, is Bresh, for example, has worked on, on the shallow water, but I, I don't remember now. It's also in shallow, well, okay, so shallow water normally are in viscid, aren't they? But then, then there's the viscous term, and there's a lot of contention about what you should put in to be for the viscous term, which presumably would also have a implications for all your results, depending on which viscous term you put. Okay, so if you have a viscous term, then you are, the question becomes different, that you are talking, when does the energy quality hold? Mm -hmm. And then there are results along these lines. Also for Navier-Stokes, when does the energy quality hold? Some of them very classical, but it's, that's, then it becomes a different problem. Thank you. Any more Okay, let's thank Daniel again, very interesting. Thank you, Daniel.